Nice. So then what is face blindness for those who don't know? Yeah, yeah. So, so face blindness uh, is also known as prosopagnosia. So that's a mouthful, prosopagnosia. It's a Greek word. Prosopon means faces and agnosia means lack of knowledge or not knowing. Uh, so prosopagnosia or face blindness is a condition uh, whereby someone is unable to recognize uh, familiar faces. So faces that you've seen before, faces of, you know, family members, close friends. Uh, and this is unlike the occasional failure of face recognition that we all experience from time to time, right? So we see people on the street, it's like, oh, I can't really recognize the person or I can't put a name on it. It's it's nothing like that. Uh, this is much more severe and it happens frequently, uh, even to faces that they, uh, they're supposed to know because they interact with, uh, with these uh, faces uh, all the time. Yes, yeah, super interesting. Um, what I found really interesting in your introduction was you mentioned um, you worked in the field of evolutionary psychology briefly. Mm. So I wanted to know what are the evolutionary underpinnings to face blindness? And yeah. if, yeah, if that is something that you've yeah. researched. Yeah, yeah. So I guess, uh, you know, uh, face blindness and face recognition more generally, I think, is one of the uh, uh, research areas, I suppose, in, in visual perception that has attracted some evolutionary psychologists. Uh, and the reason is uh, there seems to be specialized uh, visual mechanisms that are used for faces, but not for recognizing other stimuli. And, you know, at, at the time, there's a lot of uh, you know, this is about 20, 30, 40 years ago, there's a lot of debates and discussions concerning, you know, uh, the variety of cognitive mechanisms that are, you know, uh, uh, that our species, I suppose, inherited from, from you know, our ancestors way back when. And, you know, face mechanisms uh, seem like a good candidate for it, given how critical faces are for survival uh, and, and all that. So uh, that... To me, I mean, that kind of brings in kind of the two sides of the equation where you have, you know, evolutionary uh, uh, biology uh, and also, you know, visual perception and disorders in the case of face blindness. Cool. Um, so then you mentioned that we seem to have a particular uh, what do you say, interest in oh, evolutionary interest in uh, how do you say, perceiving faces. So does that manifest biologically as well? So in the brain, do you see any differences in how people perceive faces versus other things? Yeah, yeah, of course. So uh, there, there's a, a network of kind of regions uh, across the occipital and the temporal lobe uh, that seem to be specialized for face processing. So if you use, uh, you know, fMRI and you look at, you know, how these regions react when people see pictures of faces as opposed to control stimuli, uh, these regions would respond much more strongly to faces. Uh, and, and this is also true in other primates. So macaque monkey is, is a, is a great model for studying face processing because their visual system is very similar to that of humans. And they also have these, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 areas uh, across their, their kind of occipital temporal lobe, uh, which contains, you know, cells. So these are individual neurons that uh, are highly selective to, to, uh, to faces. Um, how, uh, how do you experiment on these things? So what kind of research models do you actually use when you're trying to study face blindness? Yeah, so so myself, uh, I run mostly behavioral experiments. Uh, so I work with uh, human participants who uh, report uh, having trouble recognizing faces. So so I work with them. I give them a, kind of our standard battery uh, for uh, uh, face blindness to see whether they meet the kind of the threshold for uh, for prospecnosia. And if they do, I invite them to. Uh, you know, sit on a, a bunch of experiments, right? So uh, one of my um, last experiments is on the distinction between uh, the processing of facial identity and processing of facial expression. So faces are important because we not only use faces to recognize who people are, but we want to know what they're feeling, what they're attending to, right? So there are all kinds of social information that we extract from faces. And I guess one of the key questions in prospecnosia is whether the... Uh, impairments uh, impact only the processing of identities, I don't know who you are, uh, or does it also extend to the processing of other 
information from the face, right? So, uh, so I ran a couple of behavioral studies uh, looking at whether uh, identity and expression processing can be dissociated. Um, but other researchers, they use all kinds of uh, tools. Uh, you know, the imaging is, is a popular one. You, know, you want to see whether, the, you know, the, the network of face regions, you know, there's about a dozen of these areas, uh, you know, um, on, on both hemispheres, whether they specialize in these different aspects of face processing. Maybe some areas are more specialized for identity processing, other areas for expression, for instance. Uh, in the monkey, of course, you could uh, insert uh, electrodes, right? And you could do single neuron or single cell recording. And so you could go down a level and characterize, you know, how face processing works at the level of, of, of a single cell and, you know, kind of march through and see, you know, what, what happens in this area. It seems to be kind of activated earlier because it's located, you know, uh, closer to the back of the brain versus a kind of another area that seems to be activated later, you know, so if you think about it, you know, the whole network is a, it's like a factory where you have a, you know, an assembly of processing, right? So what happens at the first stage and the second stage and, and so on. So there's a variety of methods that, that, that we use. And I think for the most part, the results converge, which is good, I guess, when you're doing, you know, mind and brain sciences, you want as many lines of evidence as, as possible uh, going in the same direction. Really, really interesting. Um, so can you shed some light on your findings or what are some of the costs, both evolutionary and current costs of face blindness? What is it that you have found through your research? You're yeah, you, about. by cost, do you mean like what, you know, how, how does it impact uh, people who have it? Absolutely. Yeah. Both, in, yeah. both in the long term yes. as a species and then both as present as an individual, if you know the answer. Yeah, yeah. No, well, I, I, <laughs> I think the, I guess the immediate uh, uh, cost is, you know, you, it, 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 prospagnosia can be socially crippling, right? If you, if you can't recognize people from their faces, then that you're, you're, uh, you're at, uh, you know, you have a, a big downside in terms of, you know, how you socially interact with people. So people who have prospagnosia usually try to come up with other uh, routes to, to recognizing other people. So they pay more attention to your voice, for example, right? So if they, you know, when they first meet you and say, hey, you're feral, and they try to pay close attention to how you speak and your, you know, your mannerisms, right? And your hairstyle, your glasses, right? And they remember, okay, I, I, I met this, this uh, woman feral in, in, in Victoria, right? So when I, when I see somebody like her on campus, I can use that contextual information. Uh, so that's, that's the best they can do. But, you know, uh, I, I Sometimes these cues, they, they fall short and, you know, they just don't work if they happen to bump into you in, in a grocery store without context and you change your hairstyle and they'd be like, I'm sorry, you know, I have no idea who you yeah. are uh, until you start speaking. Uh, and, uh, and so many, many people have, have, uh, that we've worked with have reported uh, uh, all sorts of uh, downsides, you know, um, in terms of well-being, in terms of limited work opportunities, you know, you can imagine certain areas of, of uh, or sectors where you have to interact with a lot of people, <laughs> and you kind of have to keep track of who's who, and that would be difficult for them. Uh, so, uh, and the one common, I guess, anecdote that almost everybody with prospectnosia mentions is that they they often lost the plot when watching you know certain TV shows and movies. Uh, especially those, you know, I don't know, like, you know, you have a, 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 what, a, a war movie with like, you know, 10 soldiers, all the kind of same style, same haircut, and, kind of, and they don't like which character does what, and they just like, okay, there's no way for me to to make sense of this. Uh, in terms of evolution, uh, I'm not quite sure, actually. I mean, it, it's, it's kind of interesting to, to think about how prosopagnosia can, can persist, right? Assuming that it's been around for, for a long time. Uh, the, I guess, current estimates of the prevalence is about one to 2%, depending on where you draw the statistical line. And, and so maybe that, that is still within kind of the sweet spot where you have certain conditions that can, you know, go on generations by generations without disrupting the kind of the whole balance of, of the, uh, of the, of the, of the population. So, uh, but there is, uh, I suppose I mentioned about, uh, you know, monkey uh, being a good model right before. And one, I think difference that, uh, 
uh, is often noted when we talk about human face recognition and monkey face recognition is that uh, human face recognition seems to be more specialized for recognizing identities just because we've seen hundreds, if not thousands of faces, not directly, just directly, but through magazines, you know, TVs and things like that. Whereas uh, for monkeys, I think they don't see that many. They live in small groups. So their face recognition uh, is, is probably more specialized for tracking expression changes, right? So micro, oh, he's, he's sort of like angry there. I, I picked it up. I want to go away. I don't want to get near him because it'd be... It'd be awful or something like this. So maybe these systems, you know, they're kind of similar in many ways, but they've been kind of shaped, I suppose, slightly differently through, you know, evolution and also cultural demands, right, that, uh, that are uh, different for the different species. So uh, based, based on that, how does prospectnosia come about? So is it yeah. genetic or the, uh, due to injuries or what's the reason? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a great question. So there are uh, two types of prospectnosia. Uh, uh, for a long time, we thought prospectnosia is acquired, right? So which means, you know, people used to be able to recognize faces and then they suffer some brain damage and then they lose their ability to recognize faces. And it's noticeable because I know I used to be able to do this thing. And now it's different. I can't do it anymore, right? Uh, so, uh, so that for a long time, those are the only uh, prospectnosia cases that were reported in the literature, uh, beginning in the '40s, I think. But in the last 20, 25 years, uh, we've learned a lot about the other type of prospectnosia, which is lifelong. So this is known as developmental prospectnosia or congenital prospectnosia. So people who have it. Uh, you know, they've, they've never been able to recognize faces. So for as long as they can remember, they always have trouble, even in childhood. So, you know, you imagine, you know, you go to school and like everybody looks kind of, you know, unfamiliar. And then you, you go home and you try to find your parents and kind of you, you run to the wrong adult and kind of, you know, there, there are stories like that, which are kind of comical, but actually it's quite sad because, you know, uh, you know, people used to think, well, these kids, they just don't get it. Maybe they have some learning disabilities, but it's not learning disabilities. This is a very specific visual recognition disorder that they're having. Uh, so, so yeah, so the, mo the more common prosopagnosia is the lifelong one. That's the one that is estimated to, to impact about one in 50 people uh, with, uh, to varying degrees. So um, as severity, of course, not everybody has severe prosopagnosia. Some people have kind of milder version or moderate version. Yeah, you bringing up learning disabilities is interesting because I was uh, just thinking if you're having, because of uh, a lack of face perception, if you're having in issues with social interaction, it can easily be seen as other social interaction deficit disorders like yes. autism yes. or something. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And we know uh, prospagnosia uh, is, is not the same or it's not caused by autism, right? So there's a couple of papers now. In fact, my, my latest paper is about that. So we look at a, a population of people with ASD and we managed to dissociate their uh, face recognition difficulties from difficulties that are experienced by people with prospagnosia. So there's a couple of reports now dissociating autism from, from prospagnosia. Uh, but early on, like, you know, when, when, you know, the early reports about prospagnosia started to appear, people uh, had the kind of natural suspicion. That maybe these are, this is just a consequence of people not being socially adept, right? So maybe they're not paying attention to faces in the environment. So if, of course, if you don't pay attention, then you're not going to recognize people. I mean, what's, what's so, you know, what's so hard about that? Uh, but uh, now we know that it, it's, it's not due to lack of social attention or social motivation. Uh, it's not due to general memory problems, right? So it's not just as people can't remember anything semantic about other people. Uh, and, and also it's not a general visual disorder because most people with prospectnosia can read just fine. They can see colors, they can recognize objects, uh, they can navigate the environment and, and so on. So it's, it seems to be a very specific form of uh, visual recognition problems. I should say visual agnosia. I guess that's, you know, some, sometimes people think prospectnosia is a selective type of visual agnosia. So visual agnosia is a broader term whereby some people, mostly due to injury, have problems recognizing any objects at all, right? So they can see, they, 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 uh, they can tell you uh, that uh, something is moving and what's moving is a red dot or something like that. But once you start presenting them with kind of more complex stimuli, like you show them a, a picture of a car or something, and they say like, 
I, I have no idea what that is. I can tell you it's kind of blue. It has a curvy part here and there. The right side is bigger than the left part, but I don't know what it is. But then if you ask them, like, uh, do you know what a car is for? Forget about the picture. And they say, oh, yeah, it's for driving. I have a car at home. So it's not that they don't know what a car is for. They don't lose their semantic knowledge about cars. And if you play them the sound of a car, they can tell you it's a car, right? So they can recognize a car through a non-visual route. It's just a visual pathway for recognition is, is gone. Uh, so that's the case with people who have visual agnosia. Now, prosopagnosia is like that, but just for faces. More selective, yeah.